Hello, this is Mr. White, and this video is on Rolle's Theorem and the Mean Value Theorem. And I'll remind you right off the bat that if I were to make a Venn diagram of these two theorems, the Mean Value Theorem is the broader, more general theorem, and Rolle's is just a, a special case of the Mean Value Theorem. All right, so here are the two exercises for this video. Let's get rid of that one for now. And before we jump into that, let me recall uh, for you two here that this is the mean value theorem as it's uh, stated in the book. But I, I've covered up the equation with the concepts that you really need to, to understand as well. That um, if f is continuous on this closed interval and differentiable on the open interval, then there exists at least one part along that curve, one point along that curve, where the tangent slope is equal to the secant slope. Um, so what we sh I really want you to have the mental image, not just an equation in mind, but the mental image of two points on a curve, and there's this differentiable continuous curve, and secant slope, I want you to envision this, and tangent slope would be the, the at least one point where we have a line that is parallel to that secant slope. Okay, so that's the big concept that you need to get first off. Now, how do we denote uh, a tangent slope? That's what f prime means, right? How do we denote a secant slope? That's where we look at the two endpoints and we do our, our old school slope calculation, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Except now that we're in grown folk math, it looks a little more like this. But again, if you're just memorizing this, this formula and, and you're missing the bigger picture there, it's gonna be, it's gonna be problematic. Okay, so let's recall what happens too if these two quantities just happen to be equal to each other. That's implying that the, the y values of these two points are equal to each other, and therefore you've got something that looks a little more like this, where the two endpoints have the same y value. And again, we're still talking continuous and differentiable, but notice that now the secant slope is a horizontal line necessarily. And Rolle's theorem, as it turns out, is the one that's going to say that there is at least this one point where the tangent line, being parallel to the secant line, will also have a horizontal, will also be horizontal and have a slope of zero. So again, that more specific case is what we call Rolle's theorem, documented here. So with that being said, let's uh, go back up to that first exercise. Determine whether Rolle's theorem can be applied on the clo closed interval from A to B, um, in this case, from negative one to three. And if Rolle's theorem can be applied, find all values of C on the open interval such that the derivative is zero. Okay, so as far as determining whether Rolle's theorem can be applied, I mean, for the sake of this video, you can anticipate that the answer is yes. <laughs> we'll find yes, it can be applied. But as far as what is it we're supposed to check, we're supposed to ask ourselves, is this function continuous? And we know that it is. How do we know? Because this is a polynomial. If you were to foil this all out, you'd get x cubed plus something x squared plus something x plus a constant. Um, and polynomials are always continuous. Furthermore, uh, this function needs to be differentiable. And guess what? Polynomials are always differentiable along their entire domain. So you can, when you're dealing with a polynomial, we, we know that we're dealing with continuous and differentiable. If there are trig functions or something in here, that might be another matter, but um, we know it's continuous and differentiable. Now we just need to check, is f of a equal to f of b? Um, if it's not, then Rolle's theorem doesn't apply. So let's check f of a versus f of b. Well, this is a, a setup, we're actually glad this is not foiled out because it makes it very easy to see that if you plug in a negative one here, we're gonna get a zero for this factor and that's gonna render the whole function equal to zero, right? And, and similarly, if you were to plug in a three here, and here as well, I should clarify, but we're really focusing on this, that's gonna make that factor equal to zero and therefore the entire function will be equal to zero. So we see that at both endpoints, we get a y value of zero, therefore, Check, 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 Rolle's theorem does apply. So now we just need to um, 
go for the conclusion of Rolle's theorem, that there's some place in that interval, there's some point in that interval between negative 1 and 3 where the derivative is 0. So let's get busy with the derivative. Now we have a choice here. We can either FOIL this out and then derive, um, or we can use the product slash chain rule. I mean, I'm more inclined to do the latter, but you know, it's your choice ultimately. So if we do the product slash chain rule, we'll do the second function, x plus 1 squared. And when I'm referring to first and second, of course, I mean this is the second and this is the first. So second function times derivative of first, the derivative of x minus 3, plus the first function, x minus 3, times the derivative of the second. And in deriving the second, I'll do bring the 2 in front, x plus 1, exponent gets reduced by 1, the chain, the derivative of the inside, x plus 1 there, is just a 1. All right, so let's simplify that a little bit. Uh, and actually, we, um, let's recall, we're going to set that equal to 0. So set that equal to 0. And then like looking for critical numbers, we will not set this equal to 0 or undefined. Rolle's theorem concludes, concludes that the derivative will equal 0 at some value of c, not 0 or undefined. OK, uh, what to do from here? How about we factor out the greatest common factor uh, between this term and this term, the two terms on the left-hand side? And I see an x plus 1 going into both of them. So let's take an x plus 1 to the outside and put a big set of parentheses here. And what goes on the inside? If I factor out an x plus 1 from this, I get another x plus 1. And if I factor out an x plus 1 from this, I have left over a 2 and an x minus 3 times 1, which I won't bother to write this time. Uh, if I simplify everything inside those parentheses, let's see, this is going to give me 2x minus 6. So 2x minus 6 plus an x minus 1, that's going to give me a 3x minus 5. And this is an x plus 1. So if you were at all inclined to just distribute that out, um, that would not have been the best choice. We, we tend to use this factoring technique because when we have it in factored form here, it makes it really easy to solve that equation. So we see that there's not just uh, one point, but there appears to be two. And Rolle's theorem does allow that there's going to be possibly more than one point. Um, let's also note that there, that's going to be 5 thirds. X is 5 thirds is what's going to set that factor to zero, right? So it is possible to have more than one point that satisfies Rolle's theorem. However, I have to back off on that statement then because notice that only one of those points is, on, is inside the interval. Um, we can't really count the negative one there because um, it needs to be, uh, the, the value that we're looking for needs to be in between. It needs to be on the open interval from negative one to three. And this is one of those technicalities that we don't really have to worry about very often. But what I was just referring to is notice that that's an open interval between from A to B. So um, that C value cannot be equal to A or B. Or at least there's at least one C value that is not equal to A or B, um, but is in between them. OK, I'm going to stop with that explanation. I'm probably losing you. OK, so the bottom line is since this is an endpoint, we won't count it. We'll only focus on this 5 thirds. And that is the C value we're looking for. I said x equals 5 thirds. You can just leave it at that. Or if you prefer to say C equals 5 thirds and put a box around that. Either way, we'll call it done. Um, other than checking, um, let's go to the calculator and check. And even though the problem didn't ask us to do that, it's never a bad idea. So there's our function. Uh, there are the window settings that I'm going to use for this function. And if I graph it, um, and I go to second calc dy over dx, I'm pressing the 6 button, and I type in 5 divided by 3, 5 thirds, I see that at that point, not only visually does that look like a minimum where, the, where we're going to have a horizontal tangent line, but I see that that dy over dx value is what we know from our calculator is practically 0. All right, let's go on to the next one.
Okay, here we are to determine whether the MVT can be applied to F on the closed interval. And if the MVT can be applied, let's find all the values of C that satisfy its conclusion. What does that mean, satisfy its conclusion? Well, this is the conclusion of the MVT, that there is a point, at least one point, where the tangent slope equals the secant slope. So we need to find all the, the X values, or C values, if you, if you will, um, that satisfy the tangent slope equaling the secant slope. All right, so um, what should we do? Uh, we need to see if the MVT even applies at all. We need to prove to ourselves that F is continuous um, and differentiable. So let's use our pre-calc skills. When we look at this function algebraically, where are there going to be discontinuities there? More specifically, in this case, where is there going to be a vertical asymptote? Well, due to that x in the denominator, we're going to have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. So this function is not continuous over the, the set of all real numbers. However, remember, we're not interested in the entire x-axis. We're only interested in this interval. And notice that the vertical asymptote, the, the infinite discontinuity, if you will, notice that that is not within the interval. So we're OK. We, we are continuous on that interval from 1 half to 2. Now what about uh, differentiability? Is this function differentiable? Um, generally, uh, there, there are only going to be two cases that I could think of off the top of my head where we may have a function that is continuous but not differentiable. Um, and that one case is going to be the absolute value case. So if you see absolute values in your, um, in your equation, then we know that that tends to have sharp points. And um, you, we're not differentiable at that sharp point. Um, I guess I could think of a, a one other case. How about like absolute values in disguise? So square root of x squared, if you were to graph that, you, that's really the same thing as absolute value x. Uh, that, that's not going to come up tremendously often. But any case, that's one case where you have uh, functions that are continuous but not differentiable. Um, and the other case I could think of are uh, piecewise functions. You know the type where you use the equation for, let's say, a line for a little while, but all of a sudden you have to switch to equation for a parabola. Well, there again, we have a, a sharp point and it's not differentiable there. So given that in this equation we don't have a piecewise function, nor do we have um, absolute value bars, we're going to say that this is differentiable. It, it does um, meet the conditions of the MVT. So let's go on to finding the tangent slope and the secant slope and setting them equal to each other and finding our C values. I'm going to somewhat arbitrarily choose to do the secant slope first. You don't have to, but I'm just choosing to. And for the secant slope, let's find the Y values at the endpoints. So let's find out what F of 1 half and F of 2 are. So if I plug 1 half into the uh, function equation, I get 1 half plus 1 over 1 half. That's going to be 3 halves over 1 half. That's going to be 3. f of 2, that's going to be 2 plus 1 over, um, sorry, that's uh, 2 there. And that's going to be 3 halves. So let's uh, picture what that looks like. Uh, we are going, let's see, 1, 2 here, and then 1, 2, 3. And we have f of 1 half equals 3, f of 2 equals 3 halves. That's somewhere around there, assuming that these increments I've drawn are um, a scale of 1. And we are trying to find this slope. So we could tell it's a negative slope. And the secant slope is that expression f of b minus f of a, or you could think y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? And so f of b in this case is going to be the 3 halves minus the f of a over b minus a. 3 halves minus 3, that's going to be negative 3 halves. 2 minus a half, negative 3 halves. 2 minus a half, that's going to be positive 3 halves. So that's going to equal negative 1. And that makes sense. That is consistent with our drawing here, where we had a slope going downward. So that is the secant slope. 
And given that we have our vertical asymptote at x equals 0, as we discussed earlier, we can envision a graph doing something like that, riding along the, uh, the y-axis. And we can get a sense of, OK, yeah, I can, I'm expecting that there's probably one point there on that interval where I have the tangent line parallel to the secant line. So let's shift our attention to the, to the tangent slope. And that's what the derivative gives us. So let's uh, figure out f prime of x. And actually, before we do that, uh, let me point out, we could use the quotient rule on that. And that's what students tend to gravitate towards when they see a quotient. But remember, let's, let's simplify this a little bit. Before we get to the derivative, let's just rewrite f of x as x over x plus 1 over x. Well, what is x over x? It's just 1. And 1 over x, let's rewrite it in a more derivative-friendly way. That's x to the negative 1 power. That's what 1 over x is, right? OK, so we haven't derived it yet. We've just rewritten it so that our deriving will be easier. And when I take my f prime of x, the derivative of 1 will be 0. And the derivative of x to the negative 1 will be negative um, x to the negative 2, or negative 1 over x squared. OK, and MBT says that this tangent slope has to be equal to this secant slope of negative 1 at at least one value on this interval. So let's set those equal. Tangent slope equals secant slope. And um, we'll cross multiply and then multiply by negative 1. And we'll get x squared equals 1 which will tell us that x equals negative 1 or 1. We were kind of anticipating one point, weren't we? When, when I drew this earlier, weren't we anticipating one point? Well, that's because one of those values is not on the interval. Again, we only want values on this interval. So let's cross out the negative 1. And it looks like 1 right here is where the tangent line is going to uh, be parallel to the secant line. So let's put our c equals 1. That's all we were asked to find. But let's not be satisfied with that. Let's take a look at the calculator and see if that makes sense. I'll graph this function here. And uh, I'm going to use these window settings that you see on the screen. And when I graph it, I get this. Uh, let's go to second draw. And that's where we can find out how to draw our tangent line. And I'll go to option number 5. I'll click the 5 button. And I'll type in 1, which is the c value that we, we solved for. There is the tangent line at um, c or x equals 1. If I drag it onto here, and I just draw in there the secant line. I draw in there the secant line from one endpoint to the next. We see that it sure does visually look um, parallel to the tangent line. So we can uh, got some graphical affirmation of our uh, answer that we got algebraically. So final answer, c equals 1.